Micronutrients are an essential component of any parenteral nutrition formulation. Even though each patient's needs are unique, and the prescription should be individualized to meet them, there are some basic principles that can be followed. This video will provide an overview of those principles for electrolytes, trace elements, and vitamins. Before we get started, I want to let you know that most of the information in this video comes from the American Society of Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition. This organization creates guidelines and recommendations based on regulations and products that are available in the United States. So, they're not always applicable to practice in other countries. If you're watching this video from somewhere outside of the United States, you should check your local regulations and product availability before you apply any of the strategies that are discussed. The electrolytes found in parenteral nutrition are sodium, potassium, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, chloride, and acetate, which is metabolized to bicarbonate by the liver. Current recommendations for needs are listed as a standard daily requirement, and they appear as a range of values. For sodium and potassium, the standard daily requirement is 1 to 2 milliequivalents per kilogram. For phosphorus, it's 20 to 40 millimole, calcium is 10 to 15 milliequivalents, and magnesium is 8 to 20 milliequivalents. Chloride and acetate are a little bit different. They're given as needed to maintain acid-base balance. Keep in mind that these recommendations don't represent the recommended dietary allowances, or RDA, which are used when the nutrients are absorbed through the gastrointestinal tract. These recommendations are for intravenous therapy only. To meet the standard daily requirement, each electrolyte is added to the parenteral nutrition as one component of a salt. A salt is a compound that consists of a positively charged molecule and a negatively charged molecule. Sodium and potassium both come as a chloride salt, an acetate salt, and a phosphate salt. Calcium and magnesium usually come as calcium gluconate and magnesium sulfate respectively. There are other forms like calcium chloride and magnesium chloride, but they're used less often due to concerns related to solubility and compatibility with other ingredients. All of the salts can be provided individually by the clinician selecting a specific amount of each one, or they can be added as a multi-electrolyte solution that has predetermined doses. Whether the salts are selected individually or not depends mostly on the compounding capabilities of the hospital and the knowledge and skills of whoever is writing the prescription. When ordering electrolytes in the customized fashion, the goal is to provide any combination of the salts to satisfy the estimated need for each individual electrolyte. Sometimes this means trying to land right in the middle of the standard daily requirement. Other times, it means giving the lower or upper end of the range, or below or above the range. If there's one thing you take away from this section, let it be that this is never an exact science. It's more like an art that's driven by various factors that are presented in each case. Factors to consider include laboratory values, renal function, potential losses through vomiting, diarrhea, and ileostomy or fistula, risk of refeeding syndrome, and concurrent intake from other IV fluids, enteral feeds, and or a PO diet. For example, if you're ordering parenteral nutrition for a patient with normal blood values for all of the electrolytes but they have CKD4, then perhaps you shouldn't start on the upper end of the recommended range for potassium, phosphorus, or magnesium. After all, CKD reduces their ability to clear them from the bloodstream. In this case, it would be safer to start at or below the recommended range and then make adjustments to the amount you're providing as the days go by and new labs come in. Another example is a patient with a magnesium level of 1.5 mg per deciliter. Would it make sense to give 8 mil equivalents of magnesium, which is at the lower end of the standard daily requirement? 
In most situations, the answer is no. You'd want to help bring that value back within normal limits by giving a higher amount. There are dozens of scenarios with ifs, ands, or buts that we could go through. However, there isn't a succinct way to cover them all in this type of video. Before we move on to trace elements, I want to spend a moment on chloride and acetate. As I mentioned previously, these don't have a standard daily requirement, but are instead added as needed to maintain acid-base balance. Simply put, chloride adds acid and acetate adds base. When a patient is stable with no acid-base disorder, acid-base balance is promoted by giving equal amounts of chloride and acetate, which is represented as a chloride-acetate ratio of 1. But when there's an acid-base disorder, an adjusted chloride-acetate ratio can be used to assist in the management of it. Ninja Nerd has a comprehensive lecture on the basics of acid-base disorders that you can watch here. For the purpose of this video, we'll just leave it at this. If a patient has a metabolic acidosis, it suggests there's a process going on in the body that results in the accumulation of acid in the blood. When this happens and the patient is on parenteral nutrition, the amount of chloride salts provided should be reduced and or the amount of acetate salts provided should be increased. This will create a chloride acetate ratio that's less than 1. Conversely, if a patient has a metabolic alkalosis, it suggests there's a process going on in the body that results in an excess of base in the blood. Thus, you would want to do the opposite. The amount of chloride salt should be increased and or the amount of acetate salt should be decreased. This will create a chloride acetate ratio that's greater than 1. As you can see, the choice of salt can influence acid-base balance, and different patients will have different needs based on their clinical presentation. Since dietitians are not well trained to identify acid-base disorders, doing so should be left up to a physician, and changes to the parenteral nutrition should be made as part of a team effort. If you're enjoying this video so far, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Both of these actions help me to reach new people and teach them about clinical nutrition. Next up are the trace elements. The five trace elements that are typically provided in parenteral nutrition are zinc, copper, manganese, selenium, and chromium. Similar to the electrolytes, these can be provided as single entities with a customized dose for each one, or as a multi-trace element solution with predetermined doses. Here, the multi-trace element solution is actually more common, and the product that's currently being used is called Trailament. Trailament was introduced in 2020, and it's the first FDA-approved multi-trace element solution that aligns with the dosing recommendations established by Aspen. For every 1 milliliter dose, it provides 3 milligrams of zinc, 0.3 milligrams of copper, 55 micrograms of manganese, 60 micrograms of selenium, and no chromium. This product has replaced multi-trace 5 concentrate, or MTE5, which provided higher amounts of zinc, copper, and manganese, and contained 10 micrograms of chromium. The changes were made over concerns with the amount provided in the available product, which left patients on long-term parenteral nutrition with high circulating levels of manganese, copper, and chromium, and an accumulation in tissues. Chromium can now be added individually, although this may not be necessary. Chromium, as well as the other trace elements, find their way into the parenteral nutrition through contamination of other components of the admixture, like the dextrose and amino acid solutions. More research is needed in this area to determine the extent of contamination from other components and to see how much of each trace element should be provided to avoid deficiency. Beyond chromium, trace elements that aren't found in trailament include iron, fluoride, iodine, and molybdenum. Iron isn't added to parenteral nutrition because it has low compatibility with the intravenous fat emulsion and is therefore not suitable for a 3-in-1 admixture. 
You could add it to a two-in-one amino acid and dextrose formulation if that's what the patient is receiving, but I wouldn't select a two-in-one formulation strictly for this reason. If a patient with good iron status is receiving parenteral nutrition for two months or less, then there should be low concern for a deficiency to develop due to the body's capacity to store it. Patients with poor iron status or a known iron deficiency anemia are usually best served with IV supplementation outside the parenteral nutrition and or by mouth when feasible. The other trace elements that aren't found in Trailman aren't routinely supplemented in the United States, even in patients who receive long-term therapy. Since deficiency is rare, it appears that an adequate amount is obtained through contamination of other components. Of note, there are multi-trace element solutions available in Europe that contain all of these ingredients. One last point I want to make about the trace elements is that there are scenarios where it's useful to order them individually. The first scenario that comes to mind is cholestasis, which is characterized by the reduced flow of bile from the liver. While zinc, selenium, and chromium are excreted by the kidneys, copper and manganese are excreted in the bile. So, if bile flow is impaired, then the body has a decreased ability to get rid of these compounds. A laboratory measurement used to identify cholestasis is a conjugated or direct bilirubin of greater than 2.0 mg per deciliter. When a patient has cholestasis, some clinicians will withhold manganese and copper and add zinc, selenium, and chromium individually. That's it for the trace elements. The last group we need to cover is the vitamins. Out of all three, I feel that these are the most straightforward. This is because they're almost always provided as a multivitamin solution that contains all of the fat-soluble and water-soluble vitamins. Since there are so many, I won't spend time going through the standard daily requirement for each one, but you can see the recommendations here, and I put links to documents that discuss them down in the video description. Currently, there are two products available on the market for multivitamins. One is from Baxter, and the other one is from Pfizer. These products are nearly identical, and both satisfy the recommendations in a 10 milliliter dose. There are three other aspects I want to highlight for vitamins. First, the amount provided in a 10 milliliter dose is usually enough to prevent deficiency, but is unlikely to be enough to correct a deficiency. For example, if a patient has a vitamin D or vitamin B12 deficiency, which are both common, then they may require an intramuscular injection for repletion. Second, the multivitamin solutions from Baxter and Pfizer contain 150 micrograms of vitamin K. This is something the physician and pharmacist may want to know if a patient is also on warfarin. And third, renal disease isn't a contraindication for a daily multivitamin with parenteral nutrition. Nevertheless, due to a decreased ability to filter excess nutrients from the blood, these patients may require closer monitoring. That covers all three groups of micronutrients in parenteral nutrition. We'll finish by outlining recommendations for monitoring, starting with the electrolytes. For the initiation of therapy in the acute care setting, Aspen says we should obtain electrolytes daily until the patient is advanced to the goal energy load and is stable. Once the patient is stable at the goal energy load, the frequency can be extended to 1-2 to two times per week. For long-term patients, the frequency can be weekly at first and then decreased over time if the patient is stable. You always want to ask for a basic metabolic panel with magnesium and phosphate because if you don't ask for magnesium and phosphate separately, then they may not be obtained. Turning to the trace elements and vitamins, routine monitoring is not recommended at the initiation of therapy in the acute care setting. However, for long-term therapy, they recommend a baseline measurement for iron, zinc, copper, selenium, manganese, and vitamin D. 
After that, they recommend a new measurement every three to six months for zinc, copper, selenium, and manganese. And they recommend a new measurement every six months for iron and vitamin D. The frequency can be changed using clinical judgment on a case-by-case basis. This is also true for exploring other micronutrient deficiencies or toxicities. Last but not least, whenever laboratory measurements are obtained, they should always be interpreted in the context of the illness since systemic inflammation can impact the results. Thank you for watching. You can check out all my other videos on parenteral nutrition by clicking the image on your screen.